am Megan, and this is my first time speaking here at Ancelon. <laughs> Thanks. And I'm short. And I've actually changed the title of my talk very last minute to steal my favorite newspaper headline about this case, which is dolled up disloyalty. <laughs> so the tale of Beverly Dickinson starts, as all good stories do, with overdue library books. <laughs> Belvely, a Sacramento native, proudly went to Stanford University, but she left in 1928 without a diploma and didn't officially graduate until almost 10 years later because she had not returned her library books. <laughs> Shocking, I know. After leaving Stanford, Belvely dabbled in various careers, but she didn't really find her bliss until age 41 when she discovered dolls. After a friend gifted her two dolls, Velvely became obsessed with doll collecting, so much so that she moved to New York City, the Big Apple, so she could start working at Bloomingdale's selling dolls. But the Bloomingdale's doll department could not slake Velvely's passion for dolls. Oh no, like so many ambitious and entrepreneurial Stanfordians, Velvely decided to start her own company. And this is her doll shop on the fashionable Madison Avenue in New York City. And we had to zoom in to really uh, appreciate the creepiness of her dolls. But in spite of this, to me, overwhelming and clear creepiness, her business was a booming. According to the United Federation of Doll Clubs Journal, which exists, <laughs> Velvely was a well-respected authority on dolls, a renowned doll dealer, owner of a high-quality doll shop with a prestigious address, and an early member of two of America's first doll clubs. Indeed, many people were not creeped out by these dolls. As one newspaper later put it, for centuries, dolls have been a symbol and an expression of childhood. They have never been regarded, even by savages, as conveying anything but the tenderest appeal. So why should anyone suspect that sinister plottings could be behind a baby doll? Well, surprise, surprise, there were sinister plottings. <laughs> Velvely was writing coded letters to share American intel with the Japanese during World War II. Five letters <laughs> surfaced mailed from various cities and signed with the names of other doll collectors. Real sneaky. In fact, one of the women's names that Velvely borrowed for this was her own customer, a woman who hadn't paid the bills on time when she bought dolls from Velvely. So don't go into debt with a spy. All the letters were addressed to Signora Inés López de Molinali in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I wish so badly I could tell you about Signora López, but she tragically didn't exist. The address was used, however, by Japanese operatives to retrieve espionage reports. Wartime censors, at least someone was creeped out by the doll letters, and one wartime censor, a proud patriot, intercepted the first letter and brought it to the attention of the FBI. The other four letters were returned as undeliverable to their puzzled senders, who in turn turned them over to the FBI as well. The letters were undeliverable because it turned out the Japanese operatives had stopped using that Buenos Aires address and had failed to alert Velvely of that pretty important fact. So FBI cryptographers went to work decoding the letters. I'm sure they expected some really late nights at the office, but all reports said that they were actually pretty easy to decode. One letter said, I just secured a lovely Siamese temple dancer. It had been damaged, torn in the middle, but it's now repaired and I'm redressing it into a second Siam doll. The cryptographers found out that this meant, I just secured information of an aircraft carrier warship. It had been damaged, torpedoed in the middle, but it's now repaired and being converted into a second aircraft carrier. <laughs> Another letter made reference to a wonderful doll hospital where three old English dolls were being repaired. This actually referred to a naval shipyard where three warships were being repaired. Ships. Another letter talked about an old German bisque doll dressed in a hulu grass chirp, a horrid, cheap thing. Uh, but of course, that really was talking about a warship damaged at Pearl Harbor that was in Puget Sound Navy Yard for repairs. So the FBI went to work investigating Velvely. Her background, her shop, visiting the shop undercover, interviewing other doll collectors. And it came to light she'd been a member of the Japanese American Society and had hosted and attended various gatherings uh, with the who's who of the Japanese government and military officials in the US. In fact, Velvely often attended these gatherings wearing traditional Japanese attire, you know, wearing her kimonos, showing that A, she might have needed a little more spy training, it's not too subtle, and B, placing her in a history that is long and very grown worthy of ill-advised white girl fashion. 
So the FBI was on the hunt for evidence because, as one reporter put it, these dolls spoke the language of treason. <laughs> In one incident, the FBI confiscated a doll from a 13-year-old girl and returned it to her weeks later. Evidence showed that it had been crudely decapitated. No doubt they were looking for hidden messages inside. And this doll decapitation was not the only indignity to the doll community. Some believed that even Velvely's love of dolls was a fraud. At one gathering, she was unable to distinguish between real antiques and reproductions. Whew. Where did the lies stop, Velvely? At that same party, she insulted the host's doll collection so viciously that the poor woman burst into tears. But Velvely's troubles were a lot more serious than a few doll faux pas. In January 1944, FBI agents arrested Velvely at a midtown Manhattan bank, where, according to some reports, she went down fighting, kicking, screaming, and clawing at the agents. They found tens of thousands of dollars in her safety deposit box uh, and bank account, much of it traceable to her Japanese contacts. One of Velvely's contacts had allegedly paid her $25,000 just 11 days before Pearl Harbor, and rumor had it that she had suggested meeting him in Honolulu for that transaction, to which he replied, oh no, not Honolulu. Not a good time of the year there. One journalist went for a less salacious angle on this whole story, the unpaid taxes. Velvely owed around $40,000 in unpaid taxes, which is no surprise when you remember back to those overdue library books. <laughs> and so the IRS put a lien on the funds confiscated by the FBI, which were significant. Velvely received around $60,000 for her work as a spy, which is estimated to be the highest amount paid by the Japanese to a spy during World War II. So take that gender wage gap. <laughs> But even though Valvoli was breaking the glass ceiling of spy wages, the newspaper coverage betrayed some really fun misogyny. This reporter said, all moviegoers know that the sister, sinister sisterhood of spies is composed of decorative damsels dripping with sex for the entrapment of males who turn to putty in their hands. No argument about it. The storybook Mata Hari is never a drab little sparrow of a woman incapable of inspiring fear or fascination. Not until you come to grips with real life and Mrs. Velvely Dickinson. <laughs> so Velvely was indicted by a New York grand jury uh, on charges including violating censorship and espionage statutes. If she had been convicted of espionage charge during wartime, she could have received the death penalty or up to 30 years in prison. Uh, but luckily her lawyer got her a plea deal and she was just sentenced to 10 years and a $10,000 fine. She only served seven of those years at the Alderson Federal Correctional Institution, which would later house everyone's favorite, Martha Stewart. Uh, and Velvely also served alongside Billie Holiday, who was there on narcotics charges. So even then, it was prison to the stars. <laughs> at her sentencing, the judge said, it's hard to believe that some people do not realize that our country is engaged in a life and death struggle. Any help given to the enemy uh, means the death of American boys who are fighting for our national security. You, a natural-born citizen having a university education and selling out to the Japanese, were certainly engaged in espionage. I think that you have been given every consideration by the government. The indictment to which you have pleaded guilty is a serious matter bordering on treason. Whew. So, why talk about Velvely on a night where the theme is proof? Because Velvely had the privilege of due process. If she hadn't made that plea deal, prosecutors would have had to prove her guilt beyond reasonable doubt before she could have been convicted. Velvely walked around free, having a great time in Manhattan while the FBI discovered and investigated her crimes. And once arrested, she was afforded a trial. But not everyone during this time was quite so fortunate. This, of course, was the time of Japanese internment, where more than 110,000 Japanese Americans were forced into detention camps. A horrifying and despicable moment in US history authorized by President Roosevelt and upheld by the Supreme Court. This racist, outrageous policy was justified using national security concerns. I mean, after all, what if someone was a spy? <laughs> On that note, time for a toast. I'd like to toast the Stanford librarians, <laughs> who I imagine never wanted to give Velvely that diploma because they knew, as I hope we all do, that overdue library books are a sign of deep moral failure. So, a toast to librarians. Thank you.